The ocelot is a medium-sized spotted wild cat that reaches 40 to 50 centimeters, that is 15.7 to 19.7 inches at the shoulders and weighs between 8 and 15 kilograms, that is 17.6 to 34.2 pounds. It was first described by Carl Linnaeus in 1758. Two subspecies are recognized. It is native to the southwestern United States, Mexico, Central and South America, and to the Caribbean islands of Trinidad and Margarita. It prefers areas close to water sources with dense vegetation cover and high prey availability. Typically active during twilight and at night, the ocelot tends to be solitary and territorial. It is efficient at climbing, leaping, and swimming. It preys on small terrestrial mammals, such as armadillos, opossums, and lagomorphs. Both sexes become sexually mature at about two years of age. They can breed throughout the year, though the peak mating season varies geographically. After a gestation period of two to three months, the female gives birth to a litter of one to three kittens. They stay with their mother for up to two years, after which they leave to establish their own home ranges. The ocelot is listed as least concern on the IUCN Red List and is threatened by habitat destruction, hunting, and traffic accidents. Populations are decreasing in many parts of its range. The association of the ocelot with humans dates back to the Aztec and Incan civilizations. It has occasionally been kept as a pet. In 1998, results of a mitochondrial DNA control region analysis of ocelot samples indicated that four major ocelot groups exist, one each in Central America, Northwestern South America, Northeastern South America, and Southern South America, south of the Amazon River. A 2010 study of morphological features noted significant differences in the size and color of the Central and South American populations, suggesting they could be separate species. In 2013, a study of craniometric variation and microsatellite diversity in ocelots throughout the range recognized three subspecies. We see here Leopardo pardellus pseudopardellus, the subspecies that occurs in South America. The Agami heron is a medium-sized heron. It is a resident breeding bird from Central America south to Peru and Brazil. It is sometimes known as the chestnut-bellied heron and is the only member of the genus Agamia. In Brazil, it is sometimes called the Soco Beja Flor, meaning hummingbird heron, thanks to its unique coloration pattern. This uncommon species is 66 to 76 centimeters, that is 26 to 30 inches, in length. It is short-legged for a heron and has a thin bill which is considerably longer than the head. The neck and underparts are chestnut, with a white line down the center of the foreneck, and the wings are shiny green. Wispy, pale blue feathers decorate the crown, sides of the foreneck, and lower back. The legs, bill, and bare facial patch are dull yellow. During the breeding season, the facial patch can change color to reddish. The sexes are similar, but juveniles are largely brown above with a white foreneck and streaked brown and white underparts. The normal clutch size is two blue eggs. The Agami heron is rare in open areas. Hence, it is curious that this individual seen here is so out in the open. The Agami heron's habitat encompasses swamp forests, mangroves, forest streams, and freshwater wetlands. They mostly occur at elevations between sea level and 300 meters, that is 1,000 feet, although records exist from elevations as high as 2,600 meters or 8,500 feet in the Andes. They nest in both single-species and mixed-species colonies 
on platforms of sticks in bushes and trees over water. Very few colonies are known to date, but some are quite large, up to hundreds or even over a thousand nests. This species is very discreet, and little is known of it scientifically. Indeed, it is a challenge for conservationists. Its remote habitat and secretive behavior may explain its apparent rarity. Despite its stunning plumage, this reclusive species' preference for shade and overhanging vegetation means that it is rarely seen. This is a quiet bird, but pairs and family groups may make various snoring or rattling sounds. Rattling sounds and slow walking away are a typical response to disturbance. Agami herons stalk their prey, including fish, frogs, small reptiles, and snails, in shallow shaded water in forested areas. They often stand still, on perches or directly in the water, or moving very slowly. They rarely wade in open water. Again, what we are seeing here is therefore quite unusual for this species. Several courtship behaviors have been described and are used by both sexes. Lores can change color to an intense red and both sexes show a short-lived silver crest at breeding time. Note that the Agami heron is considered as vulnerable by the IUCN Red List due to future habitat loss in the Amazon. Conservation efforts should concentrate on protection of important colony sites, developing a better understanding of the range, habitat needs, and biology of this species. Despite the fact that it is found in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean island of Trinidad, the Neotropical Otter, also known as the Neotropical River Otter, is one of the least studied of the world's 13 known otter species. Although its natural range is extensive and it is versatile enough to thrive in many habitats, including rivers, streams, lakes, wetlands, and marshes, the Neotropical Otter is classed by the IUCN as near-threatened and decreasing. The main threats to the Neotropical Otter in both Central and South America are habitat destruction and water pollution. Neotropical otters became a protected species in 1973, but across many parts of their range, they are still hunted and killed, particularly by fishing communities. Breeding in the Neotropical Otter occurs mostly in spring. Gestation will last 56 days and produce a litter of one to five pups. The pups are born blind, yet fully furred. They will emerge from their mother's nest when about 52 days old and begin swimming at 74 days. They are raised completely by the mother, as males do not provide any parental care. The male will only spend a single day with the female during the breeding season. The Jabiru is a huge, massive build and unmistakable stork of tropical lowlands. It is found in marshes and flooded fields, but nests high in large trees. Sometimes seen feeding in wetlands in loose association with other wading birds. The plumage is wholly white. There is no black in the wings in flight, but the naked head and neck are black with a broad red band at the base of the neck. The Jabiru belongs to the stork family, Siconiidae, in the order Siconiiformes. The unusually heavy bill is slightly upturned. The Jabiru is one of the largest American flying birds, reaching a length of 140 centimeters. That's 4.5 feet. 
The Javiro curves from Mexico to Argentina, except west of the Andes. It sometimes wanders into the United States, usually in Texas, but has been reported as far north as Mississippi. It is common in the Pantanal region of Brazil and eastern Chaco region of Paraguay. The Javiru lives in large groups near rivers and ponds and eats prodigious quantities of fish, mollusks, and amphibians. It will occasionally eat reptiles, bird eggs, and small mammals. The nest of sticks is built by both parents around August through September in the southern hemisphere on tall trees and enlarged at each succeeding season, growing to several meters in diameter. Nests are often deeper than they are wide. Parents take turns incubating the clutch of two to five white eggs. Although the young fledge around 110 days old, they often spend another three months or so in the care of their parents. The pearl kite is a very small raptor which, at first glance, appears to be quite similar to a falcon in the way it flies and perches. This small kite has a bright white belly which contrasts beautifully with the black patches on the side of its breast, its reddish-brown thighs, and the patches on its forehead and cheeks that look like a perfect blend between yellow and orange. As one might expect, a small raptor feeds mainly on small prey. Thus, the pearl kite's diet consists mainly of lizard, frogs, and insects. It will occasionally prey on other bird species and was even documented catching a ruddy ground dove. The wading bird, known as the sun bittern, displays a beautiful colorful pattern when spreading its wings, as we shall see now. Pale-legged hornero is a small, plump bird of open habitats, especially near water, found along rivers and forest edges, but is now also common around clearings made by humans. Black howler monkeys are the largest monkeys in Latin American rainforests. Notably, males are much larger than females. Black howler monkeys can be found in southern Brazil, Paraguay, eastern Bolivia, and northern Argentina. They live in primary, arid, deciduous, and broadleaf forests. The low and guttural sound of howler monkeys is one of the loudest calls produced by any land animal. Under certain conditions, a howler's call can be heard from about 3 miles or 4.8 kilometers away. The male's call is typically louder than the female's and is produced by drawing air through a cavity in an enlarged hyoid bone in the throat, which is larger in males than in females. These tree-dwelling herbivores mainly consume tree and vine leaves, flowers, and tropical forest fruits. Male members of the Black Howler Monkey troop awake each morning and give a dawn chorus that is answered by other males. Because howlers do not have an exclusive territory, sharing parts of their home range with others, the morning call and calls that occur when troops move to a new feeding site helps define, defend, and clarify the group's claim on feeding trees in their home range. Weaker troops can identify the location of strong troops and avoid that area where they would not be able to feed. Tamanduas and all anteaters belong to the suborder Vermilingua, which literally means worm tongue, describing their famous long tongues. 
the underside of their tails is furless. This allows them to grip tree branches more securely as they move through the trees. Southern tamanduas have short, dense fur. Their coat color varies depending on where they live. In the south, they have bold, dark markings over their shoulders and back, while the rest of their bodies range from brown to blonde. In the north and west, they may have lighter markings or be a solid color, black, brown, or blonde, and have no markings. Southern tamanduas are between 21 and 31.5 inches, that is 53.5 to 80 centimeters, in length, with an additional 15 to 23 inches, that is 40 to 59 centimeters, long prehensile tail. This species typically weighs around 10 pounds, that is 4.5 kilograms. Tamanduas are found throughout much of South America, throughout all of Guyana, Trinidad, and Tobago, Suriname, French Guiana, Brazil, and Paraguay. The species also inhabits parts of Uruguay, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela. An adaptable species, southern tamanduas can be found in forests, savannas, tropical rainforests, scrub forests, and mangroves, but most commonly occur near streams and rivers. They have been documented at elevations reaching 6,500 feet, that is 2,000 meters. When they are not active, tamanduas commonly shelter in tree hollows. Tamanduas mostly eat arboreal ants and termites, though they also eat honey and bees. They use their forelimbs and claws to excavate insect nests, then use their elongated snout and tongue to slurp up prey. Their tongue can be up to 15.7 inches or 40 centimeters long, while the mouth opening is about the width of a pencil eraser, a mere 0.25 inches or 6 millimeters. Tamanduas are toothless species, but have a muscular gizzard in the stomach to help them digest their food. Aside from breeding, tamanduas are typically solitary animals. They typically mate in the fall, and female tamanduas are capable of having multiple estrus cycles throughout the breeding season. Pregnancy lasts between 130 and 150 days, after which a single offspring is born. Twin births can occur, but are uncommon. As with other species of anteaters, mothers carry young tamanduas on their backs throughout the first months of life. Young remain with their mother for about one year before reaching sexual maturity and heading off on their own. Leaf cutter ants practice advanced methods of sustainable agriculture and operate under one of the most studied social caste systems in the natural world. Naturalist E.O. Wilson offered that leaf cutters have perfectly evolved to address every small need necessary for their survival over their 50 million years of existence. 
Different ants are responsible for each step in the process of cultivation of fungi. According to their size, ants fulfill specific roles, such as defenders of the colony, caretakers of the young, gardeners, foragers, and leaf cutters, such as we see here. It may not be the greatest video, but we were most thankful for this one lone sighting of a giant anteater. Giant anteaters are generally solitary. They have poor vision, but an excellent sense of smell, which is 40 times more powerful than that of humans. The giant anteater's tongue can protrude more than two feet to capture its prey of as many as 30,000 insects in a single day. Females give birth to one offspring. The young will ride on its mother's back for up to a year. The giant anteater's claws are some four inches long, and the animal can fight off even a cougar or a jaguar with this weaponry. They use their sharp claws to tear an opening in anthills or termite mounds. Giant anteaters do not destroy the mound, so they can return and feed again later. Got a chick there. It's regurgitating. The remaining the species to be seen in this part four of the wildlife of the Pantanal are species that we have presented previously. So we will dispense with any further discussion of the biology of these species and simply enjoy them, independent of any further commentary. Just not one. A sort of kleptoparasitism.
Vermelhado. É, é um peixe muito frio. Muito primitivo, cara.
Zamykamy się. Thank you. 